It's raining men. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know that they're men. Hello, all, and welcome to the 100th episode of The Vassals of King's Graves, a great linear Song of Ice and Fire reread. Before we get started, a warning. This episode could potentially spoil any events in George R.R. R. Martin's published series, including T.U.L. preview chapters. It will not, however, contain show spoilers. Our last episode ended with Tyrion heading into the Battle of Marine on July 14th. In this episode, we will be covering the Kingbreaker, Barristan III, the Dragon Tamer, Quentin IV, and the Queen's Hand, Barristan IV, from Dance. These events take place between July 15th and July 18th of 300 AL. I'm your host, Sarah, or Dr. Blood on the podcast of Ice and Fire Forums, and I am joined by Michael. Hey, Carl Wadegi on the forums. Brett. Hey, Way Raven on the forums. Dan. Hey, this is Dan. I'm Witless Chum on the forums. Adam. Hey, this is Adam Johnson on the forums. Patrick. Greetings. It is I, Patrick the Tolan on the forums. Jock. Hello, Jock. Hello, Jock. Here on the forums. And Matt Barley will be joining us later. So let's get started. First up, we have Dan with a summary of the Kingbreaker Barrison 3, which takes place on July 15th. Ahem, ahem. <laughs> All right, I guess I will go first then. Yes, this is this is the Kingbreaker, uh, where we all of a sudden started getting Baristan chapters that you know I'm sure we were all hoping for, and the number one thing we were all hoping for out of uh, out of a Dance with Dragons back in 2011 was Baristan chapters, right? <laughs> yep, wasn't the surprise, right? <laughs> I don't mind that point of view. I just. I wish it would have progressed a little more before the end of the book. Yeah, the good old Miranee's not. But anyways, a pair of mismatched conspiring men meet in the Great Pyramid of Marine. Barristan Selmy is wedded to his notion of knightly virtues and honors and wears a daily grind of being a Kingsguard as a second suit of plate. Shaka's Mokandak has hitched his and his family's wagon to the new power of the old land of Slaver's Bay and intends to use Daenerys and her regime to give Kandak a victory in the Game of Thrones that is played with the old families of Marine. In their conversation, the Shave Pate blusters and demands maximum brutality. A lot. Barristan wants this to be a knightly coup against King Hisdar Zolorak, his queen's lawfully chosen husband. Personally, I love all, reading all these Marinese names. Mo Kandak, Mo Problems? Can't relate. Shakaz insists, sensibly, that his dar is obviously in league with the Sons of the Harpy, and less sensibly, that he was definitely behind the assassination attempt on Danny. They agree, however, to cooperate on their coup. It seems like Martin is giving us a hint of history rhyming here when Barry recalls his talk with Tywin Lannister, another figure whose motives the knight does not comprehend and who is pretty jazzed about murdering children. When they before the before the uh, the knight rescued King Ares from the during the defiance of Duskendale. After they agree, Selmy immerses himself in the company, comforting duties of a king's guard, despite lacking a king, and spends time with the residents of Marine who is he, he is attempting to create Westerosi knights from. We see Sir Grandfather discourse on the nature and practice of knighthood, and then he gets into the part about crushing on much younger ladies and waiting from afar. Selmy's infatuation for Ashara Dane is another bit of just sort of of things that are just sort of off about the man who seems to do so much too late or halfway or just plain wrong. Then the actual coup comes. Barristan enters the King apartments and interrogates his dar poorly and then dispatches his bodyguard Kraz splendidly. Barry knows his business with a sword and, but much less so anywhere else. The coup succeeds more due to the good offices of Shakaz than Barristan but then they get some interesting news about dragon control. The end. Awesome. Thank you. Very concise. 
So there is a surprising amount to unpack in this chapter, I feel. Um, I thought I, so. I had a whole like page of notes. Yeah, great. All right. Well, <clears throat> what do we think? I'm not saying they're good. I just said I no, had No, that's fine. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I said a lot. <laughs> I didn't say, you know, quality, quantity is what I was referring to. Um, but yeah, what do we think about this? Okay. Well, I think there's some like beautiful writing and when uh, he confronts uh, his dar and like when the... Uh, the pit fighter comes after him and like some of the writing was like uh see i wrote some of it down then come said barristan the bold Kraz came for the first time all day somebody felt certain this is what i was made for he thought the dance the sweet steel song the sword in my hand and the foe before me then later on Kraz is like only cowards dress in iron Kraz declared circling no one wore armor in the fighting pits it was blood the crowds came for death dismemberment and shrieks of agony the music of the scarlet sands sir barristan turned with him this coward is about to kill you sir the man was no knight but his courage had earned him at least that much courtesy i just love those two lines or those two i don't know, they're not paragraphs they're just like passages yeah i, I enjoy them both because they're both i don't know just gives you a good it puts you inside Selmy's head, I guess, and I enjoy that. And inside Cross's head, <laughs> upset because he can't harm him. I, I almost feel like the the beauty of the writing in this one, the sort of lyrical nature of it, suggests that maybe it was a relief for Martin to write it too. You know, like he's been writing so much political stuff in, in Marine, and he's like, oh, finally, like good old Westerosi <laughs> night battle, you know. Right. And it's kind of the same way for Selmy. He's like in a place where he doesn't belong. He's feels awkward being there. And then finally he gets the release. It's kind of the same. It feels the same anyway. Mm hmm. This is where George is cutting through the Miranese knot. You can you can feel that. Yeah, Kraz is the Miranese knot. Yeah. He's killing it off. <laughs> Does anybody else think it's interesting that Selmy like cleans himself up and dresses in like his perfect white uniform to like do this kind of underhanded thing? Almost like he feels like if he's clean then his actions will be clean. I think so, yeah. He like ritualizes it, doesn't he? Like he makes it a, a rite of passage or a yeah, I don't. I I do. I mean, I think like almost like a ceremony kind of. Yeah, like he wants to go in there without stain, even though his actions are kind of with stain. I guess that that's his thoughts anyway. Yeah, reading it again, I got I really got the sense of how much, or I guess of how little of Barristan Selmy there really is, and he's been a Kingsguard so long that he's kind of just a Kingsguard, you know. So all these. All the uh, rituals and stuff, you know, that he falls back on, like you're talking about, it kind of seems like that's almost all there is to the character. He's just so subsumed himself into this role, and, you know, that's just all he is. He's the Kingsguard. Yeah, I mean, it's what he's done for so long. He forsake the rest of his life to do this. So that's what you become, if or you're maybe, true to it. Or maybe there's a whole uniform uh, aspect to it. Sometimes in different professions... When you sort of change your personality a little, uh, the soon as soon as you put on your uh, uniform, so it might also be something like he's not really ready to do the kind of stuff that he's asked to do before he's actually a, a little less him and a little more Kingsguard. Oh, that's a great point. There's a um, in epic heroic poetry, one of the conventional scenes is the arming sequence. Um, so yeah. it is you know, in, in classical poetry and then later in sort of medieval poetry, that pause for the warrior to to put on his greaves and his armor and his, you know, pick up his shield and pick up his helmet is a lingering moment that, that really signals that transition into like battle mode, basically. So, yeah, I think that's a great observation. George has quite a few arming sequences when you when you count them up. Like Renly gets armed just before he dies. Oberyn gets armed just before he dies as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's a really good point. Yeah. How did Selmy survive this? <laughs> Get out of there, Selmy. Get out of there. <laughs> it reminds me of a bit of trivia I saw one time where when George wrote his script for the first season of the show, where he had this whole elaborate sequence where Rob calls the banners and like you see every northern lord in his castle getting armed and then heading out to you know join his troops to head to winterfell and they of course didn't shoot that because it would have cost like half the budget of the first season or something to shoot all these <laughs> different locations and castles and stuff like that but that was how martin uh, wrote wrote his first episode of game of thrones that's really cool yeah, I still remember the first season of Game of Thrones. The tourney looked like it was like fucking a Renaissance fair. Yeah, right. Have you you, you guys have seen <laughs> so the too. the um, bad lip syncing, right? Where they make it into yeah, like yeah, a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
there's way more people at the at the Michigan Renaissance Fair than there were in that. <laughs> <scene>. <laughs> well, that was royalty. You, you couldn't. Not all commoners could go there, I guess. So what do we what do we think about this negotiation with like with the plan? I feel like the shave paid is giving in to him a lot in ways that feel very suspicious to me. Like Barrison takes it as a victory and he kind of takes it at face value. But I wondered if you guys thought that like I think Scott has got what he wanted. Do you yeah, like I really I feel like he got played and I don't exactly know. I mean obviously like Scott has wanted him to to be deposed, but like I don't know. He seems like he's like, it all checks out. It all fits like what he's saying. And I I just wonder like if we're meant to be as convinced as he is or like it's meant to be as neat a package as it's as he takes it to be. I don't think so. Like, you know, kind of like I said in the summary, I think all the stuff that the shave pit says about his dar being in league with the harpy makes a lot of sense. But all, all his arguments about how his dar must have been the one who tried to bump off Daenerys at the turn at the uh, the fighting pits there really don't add up. Because, you know, his dar, if he, you know, his dar had access to her at any point, he could have poisoned her at any other time and, you know, made it look much less suspicious than, uh, than that. So that, that part doesn't make any sense at all to me. And I think, I tend to think Martin wants us to sort of weigh that and be like, yeah, this doesn't add up. And if I remember correctly, the Adam Feldman, the the Mirnes Blot guy, had like his his theory was always that the shave pate was the one who tried to poison Daenerys, basically as as part of his part of his coup. Well, he does have the guy that made the honey honey locust under uh, lock and key, so they get to question him first. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it was um, episode ninety eight that Michael laid that out for us, and I think like I was I found it pretty convincing that. Yeah, it would have been really stupid for his star to be like, I'm going to provide all this stuff, like in full view of everyone. And yeah, well, I, don't know. I don't know what he was, what he would be trying to do. I mean, I guess you kill her and you just become the ruler alone, but he kind of has gotten everything he wanted so far. I don't know why he would try to kill her, but I don't think he'd be opposed to it if it happened. Who, his star? No, yeah, his star. Well, well it, for him to kill her now would look very suspicious as, you know, and you can see what that suspicion leads to Barristan arrest. Oh, yeah, him. obviously. Also, also, he might be politically strong, but he's the dragons is his power base. That's what he's so her control or no, maybe not so much for control anymore. But the her connection to the dragons is what keeps him in power for a while. And he's I would I think that the clever thing for him would be to ride it out a bit longer before killing her off. I actually think he'd have the backing of the young guy or thinks he would. Yeah, but I mean, if you just I saw mean, the young the, Kai are there to sack the city. Period. They don't care. I don't think they're gonna go. Okay, to I, I I can agree with that. But just if you just saw, there's been unrest in in the the, form, the other cities. Just uh, yeah, uh, at, right after because uh, yeah, there's been instability in the city. So I'm just thinking that uh, he might not be sh- completely sure that he would stay in power if he just killed her off right away. Uh, rather than sit it out a little, and then and then you know when the right offer comes, he has the backing of all the rich families. Well, we had suggested before too that the um, even like even the whole bull doesn't kill Bellas, right? So like maybe um, he just wanted to incapacitate her, or somebody did. Possibly. You know, I mean, like they didn't actually want to kill her; they just wanted to make her really sick, the way that Tyrion does with Cersei. I think was something that we had talked about. Um, you know, cause yeah, because that would work, either, for, the, well, that would work for the shave pate's purposes to make it look like an assassination attempt that he could then blame his dar for, as he does here. Mm. So that would make yeah, a lot of sense. Either outcome suits him, whatever happens. Yeah. Well, and if she's out of the way, it benefits everybody too. But like, but still, I mean, so like her being missing is kind of the best case scenario for his dar because nobody can say like, well, I guess the queen's gone. You're not in charge anymore. But at the same time, like. You know, he's, he still has her authority behind him, even if she's not, like, making the actual decisions anymore. So. Well, and that's the we thing with his dar, too, where... Chapter, um, his dar is really struggling to con- get control of the city, and there are various factions that are not supporting him. So, yeah, removing Daenerys right now was a bad idea, a bad option. Yeah, and I mean, with his dar, his whole, like, you know, since he's married to her and has been enthroned as king, he can basically just wait until she does eventually move on to Westeros and presumably takes the, uh, you know, takes the Unsullied with it, you know, with her. So he just, he just has to wait and then he'll get to run the whole, the whole city himself. Whereas, you know, other people, whereas like, you know, Shaka's can gain from, you know, can gain right now. 
I, I was struck by um, the argument or the part of his argument with um, with Chavez where like he he says that it's dishonorable and that's why he keeps discounting everything. So he says like, um, should they refuse that and only then we will inform them that the peace is broken and go forth and give them battle. Your way is dishonorable. Your way is stupid, the shape fate said, which by the way is awesome. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> He's so nitty. Right? <laughs> but it reminded me a lot of the conversation that they have um, in Astapor when she, or is it, is it Astapor? Where she um, is about to get the Unsullied and it's the, the Rhaegar fought on her Rhaegar fought nobly and Rhaegar died and it just seems like Barristan hasn't really been paying attention to like Danny's modus operandi on some level where like she's willing to if not overtly you know abandon customs like being respectful to messengers or things which are the kind of aspersions that we get cast against her later where she's like using these tactics that are like right on the edge of really shady well, I don't think they're guidelines not rules <laughs> yeah like, well okay right <laughs> um, parts of the Caribbean. I, I don't think barrison likes it when she does that and he, i don't think he would ever do that in her name do you know okay. what i mean yeah i guess i don't know it just seemed like he that like she has learned that you you know you have to get your hands dirty and she seems okay with that and then he's like well i won't i, I mean i guess maybe it's the maybe it's taking the initiative that he's uncomfortable with rather than like the. i, I, th- itself, I think he'd but... ex- i think he'd accept it if it was her decision mm-hmm. but he is not going to make that decision for her yeah that makes sense it just seemed like a little bit of a like what would danny do moment right and he's like she would take the honorable i'm like would she though like no no she wouldn't <laughs> yeah like the, <laughs> she would the, do whatever one <laughs> thing about like you know getting them while they're all asleep sounds like you know more or less exactly what she did once already so but Selmy is so confident in everything. He's like anything that has to do with battle. He's just like, oh, just I'll walk in there and kill those pit fighters. They're nothing. And, and like, well, we'll go to war with them and we'll win because I'm here. You know, it's like, he's so confident. That's a very but he's also way to quite good, in. right? Yeah, he I think good. he's probably right about all that. Uh, I mean, uh, if you just uh, compare it to the Braun fight with the uh, with the knight in the uh, in the Ve- in the Eerie, right? Yeah, that was that was supposed to be the vice versa, the 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 light armored against the heavy armored, and the the better fighter slash the most mobile fighter also won there. But here, it's a different scene. Uh, Barristan is trained <laughs> to basically be unbeatable as as soon as he ha- as long as he has his armor on and his and his trusty sword. Yeah, Barristan would have never used a sword he wasn't comfortable with. That's a really interesting comparison, though, because like it, for me, it brought to mind um, when they try and catch Arya and um, Cyril Pharrell is fighting the armored with a wooden stick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like that was that was what it called, but because the armor is basically like an insurmountable obstacle. But yeah, the, I had says that he even says that Cross is like the fastest opponent he ever fought, but it didn't matter because he was just slashing at his armor. Well, even with that part, though, if you like, if you pay close attention, Kroz doesn't barely hits him, even though he's so fast. Barristan's sitting there thinking, "Oh wow, this guy is super fast." While he's blocking his cuts, well, because he keeps going for his head, and he knows that's the only thing he needs to block. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, you know, Barristan is able to use sixty years of experience with a sword to uh... right. Kroz probably should have just put his shoulder down and just bowled into him. Yeah, I love that chipped or armor. Do... I was like, like, bet you chip my armor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, or just do like Braun did and, you know, and keep backing away from him and, you know, and dragging him around the room. Well, that's a bad to show. Tire him out. Right? I mean, like the, the... Tire out that 60-year-old man. Yeah, like the pit audiences would never have put up with that. You know what I mean? So it's probably not even in his mindset. Yeah, he wanted to show consider. blood right away. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you have to put on a show and that, you know. I mean, if you're ever watching like a UFC fight or whatever and the guy's just like dancing around the ring, you're like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> Get in there. Like, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> Also, I think that uh, Barristan has a bit more experience and would never fall for that sort of trick. He knows his limitations w- probably would be one of him. One of them would probably be his constitution. So uh, I don't think he's necessarily going to fall for that trick as well. Yeah, probably not. I mean, he is one of the best, right? As- yeah, assuming at least. Which makes me wonder: uh, Do we expect to see any of his like potential future knights in in any books in the future? Oh, the Red Lamb. Because one of them, he says. Is as good as Jamie Lannister. Wow, oh, okay. I think they'll be around, but they just won't be in focus. You don't like think they'll be like Danny's Queen's Guard or something? 
Uh, it just doesn't seem right. The fact that there's basically no character work in any of them just makes me think they'll just be part of the background. Really. Slaughtered oh, let me introduce you to George. <laughs> he brings back characters that he mentioned three books earlier and like goes in depth in their character. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an example of the of the gardening style. Like, I doubt I doubt George has any sort of particular plan to bring bring the red lamb in but you know he gave him a little bit of character so now he can go back and do that if he decides and you know in that he needs another you know a night around danny in the winds of winter or whatever <laughs> like, and then yeah. when we go back and reread we'll be like holy shit he mentioned him way back here in book five <laughs> <laughs> like guy with yeah, whip I mean, and I... trident is going to be a point of view character in the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> I did love how in this chapter, when they're having the conversation about what they should do, how he can write from all the different people's perspectives. And it shows like the different paths that they could take and how what the different personalities of the characters and their traits and their intelligence levels and the information they have all differ. And they all like have different options for what to do. And I like how he could like play out the different angles that way as if from different perspectives without having one perspective influence the others. Do you know what I mean? Because he knows all, but he's good at closing his mind off to that character and what that character knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can I just say, I think Hisdar is a passive aggressive bitch. I really hate that guy so much. <laughs> I'm like, you can see his mask coming off in this chapter. Like right? he, he has a Freudian slip and refers to his concubine as like a bed That's slave. He's like, no, no, oh no, I misspoke. He's like, ah, oh, fuck you, stupid he's, bastard. He's being a dick to the, the children. And like this, this strikes me as his real personality that he doesn't bring out when Daenerys is around. Yeah, the, the moment for me was when he's describing the tapestries. And one of the ones is a defeated Valyrian army being sold into. I'm like, dude, you're going to hang that up in your apartment when you're married to <laughs> a Targaryen? Like, that's that's bold. <laughs> like, I don't know. It just seemed very, like, yeah, very passive aggressive. He's just like, I'm just going to hang this here. We don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. But, you know, I don't know. It's just, oh, he's such a bitch. Um, Do you think he'll burn? I hope so. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen to him. I feel like they're just gonna forget he's there and just like leave him in the well, dungeon I'm assuming, and wander off. <laughs> I'm assuming Daenerys is gonna come back. I'm just curious oh, definitely. about her for at least a chapter. But I, I have a feeling that his dumb might already be dead by then. Skahas seems pretty pretty keen for his head. Right, and he does the beasts are on his payroll, so. Yeah, I mean, when I, you I consider tend to... that Barristan has to go out to war um, very soon, there might be an opportunity to, to to strike, essentially. Does he even need an opportunity? I mean, it's not like Barristan's going to be standing next to his hour the whole time. Well, Barristan is sort of, I mean, Shaka has, has to, you know, I think you kind of see it in this chapter where he's, you know, he's agreeing with Barristan, even though he obviously doesn't want to. Because he thinks he needs Barristan, I assume, because Barristan, you know, has a lot of standing, you know, as part of Daenerys' Kingsguard, the Unsullied and Grey Worm, and those guys are going to care about Barristan and care what Barristan thinks. And also he's valuable as a war leader, and Shakaz knows that he needs, you know, he's need, need, knows he needs to fight a battle, so he probably, you know, wants to keep Barristan around and on his good side so Barristan can handle that. But I've tended to agree with people who say that, you know, as soon as the Battle of the Battle of Fire starts and Barristan is out there fighting that, you know, Chekaz is going to go crazy inside the city and basically bump off all of his uh, all of his opponents. Like, in, like, there's this bit in this chapter where he's like, you know, Kandak has waited so long for this day and, you know, he's sort of saying it out loud because I guess he doesn't think Barristan will get the you know, we'll get the significance of it, but, you know, he's like, he's obviously all all in this for Kandak and not any for Daenerys. Like, he just uses, he's just using her as an excuse and, a, you know, and a uh, a means to an end where he he doesn't particularly care. You know, he's willing to, to join her cause and embrace, you know, even having no more slavery. But his whole deal is that, you know, he wants to get Kandak in position to run Marine. That was one of the things I really like about about uh, you know the Shaka's character is you know he really shows how you know there's all this the Game of Thrones is being played everywhere and has been being played in Marine a long time before Daenerys showed up and it's still being played and by people who don't really care about Daenerys and her <laughs> taking over right, the Seven just, Kingdoms or whatever. She just brought dragons to a knife fight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah exactly. both Hisdar and Skahaz are different kinds of opportunists that are trying to use Daenerys ultimately. Yeah, 
Yeah, she is a uh, force majeure, and uh, they're just trying to make the best out of it. I'm sorry. What does that mean? Force majeure, uh, or whatever you said. Uh, force majeure is uh, well, it's also it's also a legal term, but it's basically basically just means a, a power that is larger than uh, any anyone can control. Okay, thank you. No problem. It means it's usually just like war or a, or a natural disaster, and Daenerys is both. So that narratively, it would be the Deus Ex Machina, right? Arguably, or I mean, yeah, well, not no, exactly. she doesn't I mean, now that, that save anything. That's a resolution, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. So that's that's the difference. I could have, yeah, I think it's more aptly used. And she's just an uh, unstoppable force right now, or at least have been for a while. Yeah, yeah. And um, and no one really expected uh, the Targaryen Inquisition. <laughs> no one expects the Targaryen Inquisition. <laughs> I thought we had a weird, so. creepy callback to the weird, creepy moment that I noticed with Hisdar when Drogon shows up in the pit when they're talking about the dragons and he's licking his lips. Like, this guy is just so gross. <laughs> he's just so gross and I don't understand him. And he's horrible, which I guess is sort of the point. But like, oh, man, he's just, ugh, he's so skeevy. Oh, um, also, the um, we got our, uh, for all our... Um... Ashara Dane is Danny's mother. People like we got the whole Ashara looks. Danny looks just like Ashara did. Yay! The yeah, is I, this I, the <laughs> chapter where we get the line and the Stark who dishonored her? She wouldn't have turned to Stark if yeah. he had named her the Queen of Love and Beauty. He wouldn't have turned to Stark. Right. She wouldn't have turned to Stark. Which, like, I think you turn to people for help. Like that seems like the logical conclusion to that thought. Not like for you know. A, a for sweet hookup. sweet banging like because i think everybody takes that as like well she would have you know slept with me and not with him or like she would have you know what i mean which for, for all of his concern about being a soiled knight it's weird that he's like my one regret is that i didn't bone that chick when i was you know and you're like oh that's <laughs> you know like that's a that's a kind of a wouldn't it have been it's like... necessarily sex i think it's, it's just more the courtly love of showing uh, affection that's not really i kind a, of feel like, like you would have really been like 20 years her senior though, then really. Would he have? At least. Oh. He's old. He's way older He's than like, like 63. Ned. And so these events happened maybe 17 years ago. Oh. And Ned no. is like 40, right? Uh, uh, that's closer to his 30s. 35. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, that's really upsetting. That's not a dimension that I had registered before. That's gross. Um, well, yeah. I think it's even oh, it's less a... than 17 years, too, because 17 years is, I think that's show math, whereas in the, cause in the books, Daenerys is 13 at the beginning. And Daenerys is now 16. Well, John's so, 16. Yeah. It depends yes. how much time truly passed in the year of false spring and between mm -hmm. the tourney and Robert's Rebellion, all of these ambiguous dates that we still don't really know how much time has passed. R plus L equals moon dragons. Moon dragons. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't... Anytime I think about how old he gave for ages on these people, it just sometimes makes me ashamed to even read it. Yeah. Like the Sansa chapters, especially like it's kind of Daenerys chapters. Well, yeah, Drogo's that's... just like no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean it's definitely a thing where I don't think he would have written it that way if George actually had kids. Oh, that's interesting. Or if he knew the five-year gap, or even before that, his long time transitions weren't going to happen. Mm. I don't know. That Daenerys thing happened right away with her and Drogo. That. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know they know ended up in sure, love, but... but damn. <laughs> yeah, I don't know this for sure, but my impression was always that the five year gap was kind of something that came later and that he didn't end well, well, like, all the way from the beginning. Originally, originally, he wanted like big spans of time to pass between each of the chapters, and so the characters would n just naturally age. But then that didn't happen, and so we go up to a storm of swords, and it's like, oh shit, only like a year or something has passed. I need to age these characters up. So that's yeah, where the five year gap comes yeah. from. It's just because his well, writing is so kind intricate. Of, I kind of view George as like a product of his time because you know every high school show features twenty three year olds. You know, so oh, like yeah. when you don't have kids, you're like your perception of what a fifteen year old is or you know, what someone that's 18 is like if you're 45 and you're like, well, that guy's 18, right? That's the show I'm watching. Like, oh, that dude's 30, man. Like, you know, yeah. so like m maybe he's a little off, and, you know, when he's writing these things. It's like the Westerosi Dawson's Creek. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and then they made a TV show and he's like, see, I had it right. Because <laughs> Daenerys is like 20 years old. 
Yeah, so that's one of the major kind of like deep dive theories that's in this chapter, right? Or you know, for those of us who choose to see it, that there's a little bit of a crumb here, um, especially when you look at it alongside Edric Dane and what he tells um, what he tells Arya. And I don't want to get into it again. But um, the other thing that we get, the big piece um, besides Heron Hall and all of that is um, Summer Hall. We get a, a reference to Summer Hall in this chapter. Um, and I yeah, blink and you miss it. Well, yeah, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, the undefined he's... tragedy of Summer Hall. Wow, well, yeah. The... yeah. I think we'll ever get, is... like, details. Or do you think he I always think just George heard? is planning to release this in the final Duncan Egg novella, which we will totally get, I'm sure. Too bad it wasn't, like, in the final Wild Cards novella. We'd probably get that one. <laughs> it was It was really interesting to read, though, that I had forgotten that the the reference to that comes in kind of... You know, in Barristan's little think about how, you know, love is such a is such a uh, destabilizing force. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's what he, that's yeah. what he did. That's what he said. <laughs> love is a battlefield. <laughs> you know, where he goes on. You know, he goes on and thinks about all that stuff, and then you know, and then he eventually gets it to Summer Hall. So, isn't there a isn't there a quote you know, that's like, "Love is the death of duty"? Is that? That, yeah, something like that. that up? Okay. <laughs> like, like says I'm... that in the Game of Thrones, I think. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. So yeah, he tells John. Uh, but yeah, here you know Barristan's talking about how you know the Prince of Dragonflies loved Jenny of Oldstone so much he cast aside a crown, and Westeros paid the bride price in blood or in corpses. I'm sorry. All three of the sons of the fifth Aegon had wed for love in defiance of their of their father's wishes. Treason and turmoil followed as night follows day ending at summer hall in sorcery fire and grief so it, it's it's sort of interesting how barristan is con, is connecting that to love you know he starts at love and he ends up in summer hall that really struck me there that you know that's kind of how he that it does make sense that that's how he would view it as you know things things happening that are outside of the ordered world of chivalry and everything that he really relates to so it's like you know ooh. Uh, you know, love, that's like fire magic and castles burning down. <laughs> I think it's interesting Absolutely. how a lot of theories take stream of consciousness writing. Like, when he's writing people's thoughts, it's almost like a stream of consciousness, and people connect them to be connected. So, like, they thought this, and then they ended up thinking this, so obviously those two things are connected. And I know when I'm thinking that's not always the case, but I just think it's interesting how people take theories out of that and make them based on what people were thinking Maybe like several thoughts apart. Um, Barristan in this chapter, especially, I mean, because like we we kind of pointed out how he's always late or, you know, didn't quite do the right thing or didn't quite get there in time or was somewhere else when he should have been like he's thinking about when he when he saw or when Robert saw Rhaegar's kids like but he wasn't there. He was wounded at the Trident. And um, he reminded me a lot of John Con in this chapter where like he's. And even though he's still very focused on his his duty and like his identity as a king's guard, he's so like I don't know. He's so Limited. characterized by like his accumulated losses and his accumulated failures. And yeah, I don't he's know. He's full of regrets, like all of these old characters are. Yeah, except old Nan. Old Nan wins. <laughs> <laughs> so next chapter then? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um... Okay, let's see. Our All next right, chapter. This one is mine. Yes, with Quentin. Yep. Uh, okay. Quentin for the Dragon Tamer, and Michael has yes. the summary. Dragon Tamer. Quentin anxiously waits for Dawn to come with Garrus and Archibald. They put the brazen beast masks that they have been provided by the Tattered Prince and head to the Central Pyramid. Once they arrive, they gain entry with their password at the first gate, meeting up with members of the Wind Wone. At the second gate, however, uh, the password of Dog fails, and a fight breaks out with four of the Brazen Beasts. Quinton notably freezes up in the fight and has to be tackled by Garrus to avoid impalement by a spear. As they enter the Dragon Pit, Quinton observes that Rhaegal has broken free of his chains, and that Viserion has created a cave in the ceiling of the pit. Viserion flies down to Pretty Maris, looking for Daenerys, before then trying to escape out of the open doors. A sellsword lets off a crossbow bolt, which angers Viserion and gets him killed. Arch and Garrus tell Quinton that the plan will never work, but Quinton raises his whip. He tries to cow Viserion the same way that Danny cowed Drogon, but feels a hot wind behind him, turning around just in time to see Rhaegal spewing fire onto him. He realizes that all of him is on fire and begins to scream. End chapter. <laughs> and goodbye, yeah. Quinton. 
Yeah, and go back winter. Not yet. He has three days of this. <laughs> yeah. Oh god, we can get into yeah him suffering horribly, but yeah, fire's a horrible way to die. Sounds I, like something. It. Something I notice is when dragons breathe fire onto people, often um, the fire will be so hot that their eyes will burst. Yeah. Um, this, yeah, it's 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 a wonderful description by George. You know, I'm glad he keeps putting it in there. Um, and they they run down like jelly onto their face and ugh. the soft popping sound. Yeah. <laughs> I do think in this chapter, like with apologies to Bina, I do think that 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 preview death by dragon fire is so graphically depicted to erase the possibility that like his eyeballs pop and his mask melts and you know what I mean? Like I, I just yeah, don't. It's, it's pretty. Yeah. yeah I just, it wasn't him though. You know, it wasn't him. It was someone else. I just, I like, can somebody outline that? The, like, cause I genuinely do not understand how he went from like, Oh shit, I'm everything on fire. And my skin is sloughing off to like, no, he's fine. Like, w- like what's the actual underpinning for that? Quentin is alive. Um, I think it's that when um, he was forced to sign a deal with the Jordan Roots, he swapped out um, a child with one in the in the gardens, and um, Leo Quentin went with his mother to Norvos. Oh, Wait, so it's oh not that this guy God. is alive; it's that this guy is not Quentin. <laughs> Well, that's no, kind both. of contrived, no? <laughs> yeah, that feels totally random, but... Um, yeah, I heard this I is embarrassing either. Room. He's just pretending to be. <laughs> They're all faceless. Yeah, yeah I thought the switch happened with the pattern quilts in this chapter, but no, okay, I clearly wasn't paying attention. Oh, so I, like, I was under the impression Jacobs. that people were like, no, no, he, he got better, you know what I mean? Like, or like it's, just a, it's just a flesh wound, but like, it's, the theory is that it's not Quentin, not that this guy didn't melt. Right. It's not like the dragon fire turned into a chrysalis and he erupted a beautiful butterfly. I mean, I think there's both versions, actually. So oh, really? some people oh, okay. are actually like that. Well, someone like... actually thought he turned into a butterfly. Yes. Oh, interesting. <laughs> then Daenerys will marry him. She likes butterflies. <laughs> Little Miss Sandy would That's why Miss Sandy was taking such good care of him. Tickled by him. Yes, like... right. <laughs> I didn't get a dragon, but I did turn into Moth last so. <laughs> My daddy will still love me. I... So I have a question. Ooh, okay. um, in this chapter, do you think Quinton would have succeeded if it was just Viserion and Rhaegal didn't pull a surprise fire attack? Uh, I don't know how far he would have gotten with it. I don't think they would have got that thing chained it on the cart. He might not have died, but I think the dragons would have escaped and he wouldn't have tamed one. Yeah, I agree. I think, I mean, first of all, it, whatever the chaining it and putting it on a cart was like one step too stupid like i feel like if you yeah know, it just sounds right, ludicrous right, like, no we'll feed them and then they'll get tired it's like jesus Christ, we'll what just like about? bundle them up and put them on a ship it's like you know they fucking breathe fire right like you don't have to be unchained to do that that's kind of just a thing that they can do like with their faces like he's digging a hole in rock yeah <laughs> he's not gonna be chained onto a ship I, can, does anyone think that viserian is a girl well, the thing we're told is that dragons are neither male or female, and so it was actually presumptuous of me to refer to Rhaegal as a he, um, but the sequential hermaphrodites, so that they're male and female, and they switch back and forth. Oh, that's interesting. I, I, I have an egg feeling here. Like I, I don't. I think it's weird that one of them made like you're a waiting for it to hatch. Like, I'm ready. I'm ready. Well, no, but I think that like I, I think that there's a possibility because like it's up in the ceiling, so nobody can see what's in there, right? But like the fact that Rhaegal defended them, I don't know it. Um, like the but then they left it. The eggs. Yeah, I guess I don't know. Like it just it seems like they're they're connected in a way that is perhaps right. they were. Maybe they were making a nest to have eggs and then they didn't get to it. And now that one of the pyramids is where they're like keeping their eggs and that's why they're killing everybody that tries to go up there. Maybe. I don't know. It just struck me that like one of them made a bro and one of them didn't. I guess maybe it just had more time because when maybe Quentin, they took turns. When, well, when Quentin was down there, he says that um, Rhaegal was still chained and then like he was loose. You know what I mean? So like maybe it was just that Viserion was loose for longer and like had more time to make a nest. But I just there's something like they seem very Lannister to me in this in this chapter. <laughs> Like, like super friendly siblings. My uh, like... interpretation of this is that it's established that Rhaegal is the more dangerous one, and he's more aggressive. So I, it makes me think that Viserion sort of was trying to get out of Rhaegal's space. Sort of what happens in the Sand King novels when you have the different Sand Kings without getting into spoilers. But yeah, basically the less powerful one was getting out of his way. But I don't know. Oh, so when sense. Drogon left, they were like, finally. <laughs> yeah, that guy's a bully. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's that's really interesting. Yeah, because if he was just like if they were both chained down there together and Rhaegal was just like taking on Viserion. Yeah, that makes sense too, I guess. Well, it's disappointing. Um, that I did think it was really interesting how throughout the chapter they kept calling them monsters and like talking about how terrifying they were and how, you know, hellish and all this stuff. And then there's that moment where Quentin very specifically at least projects that um, Viserion is interested in Pretty Maris because he misses his mom. And I'm just like, oh my God, that's so heartbreaking. Because like he had been thinking about his mom and then like this terrifying hell monster is like, are you my mommy? And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> sad he wants his mother and does not understand why she's not here I'm like aw poor hell monster spoken like a parent of young children <laughs> why didn't the password work is it because Skahas had replaced the regular guards with his people I guess it, it sounded like it wasn't supposed to work the first time but those dudes were just like yeah whatever it like, did do right do it. yeah but like why <laughs> Also, I think it could be, I mean, if this is conjecture, but I think that uh, it can make sense if you are trying to trap people and intruders in to have uh, like a, a slower cycling of code names on, on the outer door and then have a, a tighter system in the inner one so that the people get caught in <laughs> the system, basically. I don't know. This is conjecture, definitely. <laughs> or they just never had a real password. Definitely. Had they, if they'd walked up and said Grolio, would those guys have just stepped aside? Yeah, I think so because they, they were all locusts. So I think that the like yes, like, Gahaz had specifically selected a, a few important areas that were going to have the 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 right password. Is it weird that the dragon pit was one of them? No, that makes, I, I that makes think sense so. to me. Like that's what you'd want to guard when you've got a coup going on. Okay. Those dragons guard themselves. I don't know if you noticed. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the, um, like we talked about the horror writing in the pit when Drogon comes back. And obviously, like we've talked a lot, and Duncan has that essay about how he builds dread right before the Red Wedding. Um, but I think that this chapter is another just like amazing example of that. Because right from the very beginning, like Quentin is already thinking about himself as though he's dead. Like he's like, oh, I wish I had done this, you know, before before this point. And like he, he doesn't think it's going to work. And it's this kind of very potent, horrible combination of fear and regret and f forgetting and lost possibilities and it's just right from the beginning you're like oh this is just gonna go to shit <laughs> yeah i don't remember reading it the first if i felt that way reading it the first time because but you know I, at least on reread it's very much like you know oh yeah he's he's really he's really telling us that this is not going to work right from the beginning and that, you know, this plan is going to go horribly, horribly wrong. It's all very like, you know, it's all very like, you know, the dream, the dream where you're where, you know, you sort of are experiencing it, but can't act. Yeah. Yeah. It, is all, it, it all has that. Is it weird that they have this? He has this thought that Daenerys showed him the dragons so he could take one. Yeah, we were arguing like about it, that. Like, I don't know why she like, I, I don't know. I, I can understand her showing him the dragons because it's like you come all this way. I might as well show you a um, show you the, the money. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I, I do think it is possible that there is like subconscious stuff going on in Danny's motivations there. But I also just think this is Quentin looking for meaning where there might not be any. Right. I do think she shows people the dragons to see how the dragons react to them because she does take some credence in the way they treat people. Like, that's why she trusted Brown Ben, even though she shouldn't have, clearly. Yeah, yeah. The, dragons the dragons have been excellent like judges him. of character thus far, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. they haven't to, been be, to be fair, <laughs> the uh, the dire wolves with the Starks work exactly like that. So, Danny just is reading the wrong genre. <laughs> well, I think the problem with Brown Ben Plum was she wasn't doing what it would take to win without causing a lot of casualties. Like, he's just like, let the dragons go, kill them all. And she's like, no, we can't do that. And he's like, well, then I'm not with you, because he's in it for himself. But I do think he would have stuck by her had she done what it took, I guess. Go on fire and blood. He's not in it for, like, close calls. He just wants to have a route. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I don't, Brown Ben definitely didn't betray her as soon as, you know, as soon as it might have made sense for a completely, you know, just completely ruthless sellsword to have done it. I think he stuck around a little bit longer than, you know, some of these other sellsword captains would have. He did plan it out, though. He's like, well, let me go see if I can turn some over to us and just give me some gold so I can make sure we have enough. And then he just never comes back. 
um, the other thing that struck me in this chapter was the motif that some people have pointed out of the screaming hinges. Um, and that's obviously something that's like really important in um, the uh, damp fairs chapters. But it's also, it becomes a motif in the books of places that people aren't supposed to be, like a, like a warning. I think there's one in um, uh, Brienne's chapters, too, like right before she meets the bloody mummers. Um, but the, the screaming hinges are like a signal from George that something really bad's going to happen. I said damn fair. No, you're going into I did a, say damn fair. And Matt's asking, I guess I'm doubling down on the damn fair production. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that. it's in places that are not used often and people don't go. I, I do think he uses it as like a caution. Yeah. Look, there's something bad about to happen. Like an atmospheric kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly can't think of any point in the books where it was like, you know, the hinges screamed and then Bran went into the room and got a nice hug from old man. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, or, yeah. Screaming hinges. Ooh, cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's a feast. <laughs> right. Uh, feasts aren't necessarily a good thing. No. no. Get away from there. <laughs> uh, feast I don't know. And, I and screaming hedges. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, anything else about this chapter, about the dragons? I just think it's so sad how he's trying to control his own narrative. Like, he's so determined to be in this heroic journey. And then he, he has that moment where he's like, oh, no, I'm turning back into the frog. And it's like, first of all, like, you're a, a person, <laughs> not this narrative <laughs> that you're trying to. But it's so sad that, like, that's he, – he really can't think about himself in any kind of, like – self-aware well it's all for the family that's why he's here that's what he needs to do yeah he needs to prove himself worthy to his father they may be dornish but i am dorn years from now when i'm dead this will be the song they sing and i'm like are you though like i I don't know i just think he's trying to hang on to something that he can be like yes this is who i am and he just doesn't have that and i think that's so sad i mean if he was just looking for a metal death he got it i just don't know if it was at the point in his life he wanted to have it like nobody's gonna remember this. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like people talk about with you know with some of his thoughts in the early chapters though, where he's you know thinking like we can't you know we can't turn back now because all these bad things have happened on this trip. So he feels like he has to just keep going and right. you know owes it to the people that have died to finish. Yeah, yeah, but of course you know there's like a fallacy named after that that <laughs> says you shouldn't do that, <laughs> but Quentin can't help it. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I, uh, yeah. I mean, I get it though. You know, you don't want people to die in vain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these sunk costs and oh my god, now I'm on fire fallacy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so specific. Is Doran Martell a, a bad father, in general, or because you know both his kids are you know doing a bit stupid stuff to prove themselves? I don't know. I don't Seems think he's like, any worse than any other of the fathers. No, it's like he says, know. you know, the prince, He when his wife asks him, you know, what sort of father pays his debts with his children, and he says the princely sort. Yeah. Right. I think he's just like, royalty. like a southern ahead, Tywin Lannister. Like, he's just, he's he seems nicer because he likes children, but, you know, they all just, they're all just theoretical pieces to him, I feel like. Hmm. I mean, he's not think, quite as he's not quite as bad as Tywin Lannister, just because you know he he doesn't act out quite as openly as Tywin does. Where it's like you know, I'm mad I'm mad at these people, therefore I have to sack King's Landing. Yeah. You know, Doran's like just, you know I'm mad at these people, therefore I'm going to you know subtly plot against them. Kind of brood on it for yeah. So he's a he's a weenie Tywin Lannister, I think is what we're saying. Right? Maybe that's Tywin just has right? more leverage. I mean, they have the gold, and the crown kind of needs them. I mean, I think Tywin is just, you know, seven times the man baby that Doran is. <laughs> well, didn't Tywin himself say that Doran was worse than a Game of Thrones? Like, um, that Doran plots over every word. He yeah, he's... He said to Kevin before the battle. Like, he focuses on every single word. It sounds like he's pettier than Tywin Lannister. Yeah, I mean, I get, like, he does, He he's so obsessive and he's focused on, like, the long game and... I mean, he says himself, right, that like when the Red Viper was around, that they they worked in concert, right? Like that he was the Viper and Doran was the grass that he hid in. And like that made a lot more sense to me. And I I wonder how much of what we see and sort of are frustrated by with him is exacerbated by the loss of Oberyn. Because we don't, do we see him before Oberyn died? We don't, right? Because Oberyn's our first introduction to Doran. 
So I wonder if but maybe we, like that was it kind of stripped his his sting. There's also something. only been like a handful of Dornish deaths in the whole war. Just two of them happen to be related to him. So you could say he's sacrificing his family, like almost to keep his family out of it, but still staying slightly in it. Well, he's sacrificing his family, but keeping Dorn out of it. Like he's right. You know, he's he's at least you know you at least have to give him credit that he's not just rushing his country into war, even if he's pushing his children in there. You know, the, it's sort of like, you know, the, the Martells, he, he's looking at it more like the Martells have a, have a vendetta against Tywin Lannister, but he's not dragging Dorne into it as much as he might, you know, being the ruler of Dorne. Oh, that's a really good distinction actually. Yeah. Because usually when the, when the great houses have a beef with somebody, it's just assumed that all of their vassals like share that. Yeah, that's interesting. But Dorne is very separate. They're so different. They probably have one of the, other than maybe the Vale, well, the Vale and the North are pretty pretty easily defensible, but Dorne is kind of the same way because they have all the mountains and stuff. It's almost like natural barriers to their land. Yeah, don't they say Dorne, Dorne defends itself? Right. Yeah. It's it's easy to invade because of the seacoast. You know, you can land anywhere so long as you have the ships and... Like that's what they do in the in the original conquest with the young dragon, but it's the doors just move around. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to invade, but that doesn't make that doesn't mean that it's not hard to conquer. So it's just like we'll last longer than you will in our land. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Let us move on. After Quentin Four, we jump to Barristan Four, the Queen's Hand, which takes place three days later, on July eighteenth, and Brett has the summary for this one. Okay. We open to Quentin dying three days later. The two dragons escaped, and if not for the rain, they may have burned Marine to the ground. He looks at the body of Quentin and wishes he had never made his journey, and the question, oh, Quentin had never made his journey, and questions whether his queen is still alive. He makes himself believe she is. He remembers her riding away on Drogon, her hair aflame. Barristan is reluctantly takes up a, up the title of Hand of the Queen. Skahaz tells him that they have uh, hunted down all the sellswords in Yunkai inside the city and have manned the walls in preparation for an assault. The Highborn have gathered and demand the dragons and Skahaz be killed and Hisdar freed. The Harpy have killed 42 people since his arrest and there will be more, they assume, by the end of the day. They have a closed council meeting with representatives from Danny's followers and some of the others he believes deserve a place in a say of what their approach to Marine's future is with Danny absent. Barrison knows if they get any evidence Danny is dead, the council will fall apart and Marine will collapse. So far, the dragons only killed men who oppose them and are still sticking to sheep. So they, in the council meeting, they argue over how to get the hostages back. And Barristan is laying out battle plans and listening to their thoughts on what the best approach is. To prevent the death of the hostages, Barristan has a plan for Quentin's men to rescue them, but they must be convinced. They are reasonably upset to, and blame Danny for Quentin's death, even though she's not really to blame. He offers them their freedom and a ship to return Quentin's body if they cooperate. He plans to send them back to the tattered prince with his men. Barristan reflects on whether he's doing the right things while he awaits a meeting with the Green Grace. When she comes, he tries to convince her that releasing his dars, she tries to convince him that releasing his dars was best for Marine. She informs him that Yankai will only release the hostages if the dragons are killed. They are interrupted by Skahaz and the Yankai are firing their trebuchets. Barristan is relieved. War war it is then. He understands war. They are not flinging stones though. The Yankai are fleeing corp are flinging corpses. It's a chapter. It's raining men. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know that they're men. Fine. They could be women. They could be women. You're right. That was that was very insensitive of me. They could also be flinging the desiccated corpses of women. I, I apologize. <laughs> or maybe or they just don't want to. There's a hermaphrodite yeah, out there too. Nice we know that. Fresh. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's um, germ warfare, right? I mean, that's the the feeling that they're spreading. Assume, yeah. They're, yeah. Their preferred pronoun is them there. Uh, them they. Uh, okay. <laughs> the corpses, <right? laughs> like the dragons. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, very unsensitive of you. Yeah, I'm, I, I apologize. <laughs> I do. I apologize to all of the corpses who might be listening to this. Um, I, I will try to be more careful. All the, the fictional future. corpses, right? Exactly. All the all the all the the fictional plague victims that are listening to the vassals of King's Grave. We thank you for your continued patronage, and we uh, <laughs> we I'm apologize if we've given offense from from the future. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Feel free to join. Our Patreon account is now. <laughs> <laughs> Quentin's skin is falling off. That's always a good sign that you're going to recover. 
Well, that means you're about to come out of the chrysalis, right? Oh, sure. It's just going to be a skeleton with plus eyeballs. Yeah, a oh, wild wings. God. <laughs> yeah, plus beautiful butterfly wings. Oh, my God. That's so upsetting. Disgusting. Just a, just and thus, a... Quentin's alive. Right. <laughs> Confirmed. We love you, Bina. Um, We've seen people come back from the dead before. Why not him? Oh, my God. Can you imagine if he were, well, like, some just kind of bones. flaky ass? Puss eyeball Lady Stoneheart kind of situation. Like, <laughs> he's all, hey, has anyone seen my dad? Is he proud of me? Like, oh, dude. Well, you, you need a tongue to articulate, so. <laughs> he doesn't have lips. We don't know the tongue situation. <laughs> Which, like, let me just let me just take a moment to highlight my Miss Andy is creepy AF situation here where she's like look he's smiling <laughs> person's like he doesn't have lips <laughs> oh my god <laughs> how could awful. you possibly know that like so disgusting you're like no his mouth is melted away right. <laughs> his skull is smiling at you. so gross she's a broken girl that's sure for sure right broken. How, how old is she in this for real like she's very very young she's right? 11, 11 he says 11, yeah 12? No, he says he says in this chapter, Barrison does. He says, um, "Let me find out." Hold on a second. It's like Who I think the he fuck says, "Recap this chapter and doesn't know that." Jesus. Ah, oh, bastards! <laughs> Shocking lack of knowledge. Wow, right, we're hitting it all is, of it. It is eleven now that I think on it. I feel like that's a that's an optimistic estimate of the clever that's sitting at the table. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of the people at the table are clever, just in their own way. They're not clever to help him win this war. I don't think Barristan is the greatest judge of clever either. Sure. Because he's very much not. Oh, Barristan. How do, how do we feel about Barristan? Like, what's our what's our stand on Barristan? Give him a... I think he's an excellent Kingsguard. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite about it. He's fairly good My by Westerosi standards as a person. Yeah. He would have been great in the Night's Watch. <laughs> he would have been. He would have been so an excellent Lord Commander. Of, uh... <laughs> Barristan's cleverness. There is um something he gets wrong in this chapter, which might be a retcon. Um, he's he's reassuring Missande that oh, when the dragons come, many in Westeros tried to bring down Aegon and his sisters, but none succeeded. Um, but reading the World of Ice and Fire, we actually do know that Rhaenys and her dragon Meraxes were brought down like this exact same way. Uh, and I just thought that was really funny because, like, this detail strikes me as something that George had in his mind for a long time um, before he wrote The World of Ice and Fire. So I just, yeah, Barristan's an idiot. He can't remember things. I think it's interesting yeah, right. that they think that the dragons will be on their side. Like, some of them are asking, will the dragons be on our side if we fight? It's like, how the fuck are the dragons <laughs> supposed to know the difference? <laughs> right. You're like, you, you, think you guys are all just and... meat. <laughs> like, just flammable meat. Yeah, go hang out next to a river where there's crocodiles and see if they know which one of you is the, from the other. Just to uh, go back to Barristan for a minute, I think you guys are giving him a much too much pass for all the stuff that he stood by and watched as far as with Ares and, you know, all the atrocities that Ares did. And then, you know, all the, the stuff that he sat around for Robert with and everything like that. Like, I, And I that much... made him an excellent Kingsguard. Yeah, that's that's been my feeling about him. That in itself is not moral. Or... <laughs> but it's, I mean, he's, yeah, there is a very, very, like, uncomfortable kind of, I was just doing my job thing. That yeah, I mean, get. That, that would also make him an excellent Nazi. Yeah, right, so exactly. I yeah. don't give him too much credit. As well, but he's as... good at taking orders. <laughs> yeah, but that's the Kingsguard's for... job. They're not there to think for themselves. Well, like they, in, that, in that aspect, you you're not there to question the king. That that may not be how it's Kingsguard. how it's said, but I mean, Jamie Lannister was the one who was the Kingsguard who saved the whole city by doing. And I bet you did. Barristan hates him for that. Oh, absolutely, Barristan hates him for that. Although Barristan doesn't know about the the wildfire, but I don't think it would change his mind if he did. But I mean, I think you know, I tend to think that's part of what we're supposed to think is. You know, the in Barristan may be the perfect exemplar of the institution of the Kingsguard, but the institution of the Kingsguard is not that great. It was inherently flawed. And we, we learned that from Jamie. It too, depends right? on where you're standing. About Rayella and how Ares was raping her. And it was like, well, we're supposed to protect all the royal family. And I was like, well, not from him. And it, there's a there's a line that becomes very blurred over like what's right for the Kingsguard. And I think, yeah, I think Barristan is so wrapped up in the oaths that he's taken that he, he doesn't question like that aspect of it anymore um, yeah they, they make you swear and swear yeah um well um 
isn't it like a necessarily part of institution like the trade-off you have to do like um, with lawyers like attorney client privilege like people we didn't trust lawyers if they didn't have it so lawyers um often um, would ha- can be put into um, fairly unethical situations that they have to abide by in order to maintain the professional trust and institutional integrity yeah. So the same thing for King's Guards. Yeah, that's a really yeah, good I point. Think it's, yeah. yeah, it's like any institution is like that. But if your attorney, you know, through attorney client privilege causes a whole city to explode in wildfire, I think we're going to look back on it and say he probably should have broke attorney client privilege yeah. and, you know, compromised his uh, professional ethics in that situation. Well, and in fact, in um, like a therapy situation, right, you still have um, patient therapists confidentiality unless there's a, a credible threat like that then yeah, you're required to, to disclose things. it right yeah so um like therapists and lawyers they're not the physical force that like the king's guard is so i, I feel yeah but the physical force the, is there to protect the king i i guess what i'm getting at is I, i'm not saying that he made the right decisions morally i'm saying he made the right decisions honorably and i don't know as if I think he regrets his decisions, but he knows that that was right for his position, and that's who he was, is. Was it right for his position, though? I mean, if he had if he had killed James, you know, Ares when Ares started going mad, and you know, then the Targaryens would still be on the throne of Westeros. So he would have protected his charges better if he had, you know, just straight up murdered Ares and let Rhaegar take over. Well, who I makes that so, decision? I mean, just to not as a king's guard. As a king's guard, he would be failing. You as a king's guard have to make that decision uh, and to complicate so it even further right, we're saying like well at least he's a good king's guard but in fact he has a review in his head like this running list of kings plural that he has served and it's like well how you know affect it like we're like well at least he's good at his well, job. He's, not a blood he's, like, rider. he's actually pretty <laughs> shitty at his job like yeah i guess uh, i guess he's not like required to he's never been there when they've died right he was there when Robert got gored by the boar. And he was and... there when um, Ray Gar died on the trident. And So like I said, he was never he there. Tried his, <laughs> he tried his utmost. <laughs> right? But like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like we're like, oh, well, we can excuse his choices because he was like being his bestest Kingsguard. But like also maybe not even that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So <laughs> conspiracy <laughs> theory, every, he knew about Ashara Dane's child, Daenerys, and he's been <gasps> conspiring to put her on the throne this whole time. Confirmed. Brilliant. I'll take it. <laughs> I love it. Case closed. Post it to Reddit. Yeah. Did nothing to save Robert. Let, oh <laughs> let Prince Rhaegar die. <gasps> I love it so much. This is my new favorite theory. And then as soon as he was gone, he left to go be with Daenerys. Yeah. Checks out. This sounds as good as Moon Dragons. How fucking dare you? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, how did wow. Melisandre Genius. get to Dragonstone? Because Barristan paid her passage. What? Sure. <laughs> thereby, thereby discrediting Stannis as an uh, as an alternative to Daenerys in Westerosi eyes by making him a worshiper of not the Seven but the Fire God, whose name I'm forgetting. R'hllor. At what huh? point does huh? Daenerys R'hllor. R'hllor. Yeah. What point does Daenerys worship the Seven? So back to this chapter, guys. Um... <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So one thing I really like in this chapter is uh, the green grace. Um, you get a real sense of like her character and what she cares about and just her ideology. And when you combine this with the very likely uh, chance that she herself is the harpy and is ultimately an antagonist to Danny, she comes across as a very strong character here, I would say. Do you think she's the Varys of Marine? Yeah. Like she's in it for Marine. Oh yes, yes. Her people. She's she says, you know, my people have lost all hope and she's clearly mournful and when they start throwing the corpses, she's despairing. Like she she cares about Marine. That's her ultimate motivation. I, f- I feel like she's a much more elitist Varys because I don't think that she cares about the freedmen Slaves. or the yeah, like I think <laughs> she's very like pyramid centric, right? So like she's very sad yeah, think... that the pyramid people are are like the uh, Southern being Confederate generals. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. About what? Yeah, I mean that's that's much more who she who she is as far as you know she's, you know if she I I tend to believe she is the harpy. So you know she's been acting all along to not for the good of everyone in Marine, but to for the good of her class and maintaining its power. So. You know, she's not as, you know, the shave paid is is not uh, exactly altruistic either because he's all about Kandak. 
but he's at least more willing to work with all the, you know, all the classes of Marine and, you know, and thinks, you know, that's okay. Whereas she's, you know, very much about maintaining, you know, the pyramid families in power. So I, I think they're, you know, they're both sort of working, working, you know, neither of them are working for, uh, you know, for the good of the realm or the good of Marine. But, you know, of course, Varys isn't either. He just says that. He, Barristan strikes me as just the nettiest Ned in this chapter, especially yep. when he's meeting with the Green Grace, where he's like, you've been such a true and loyal friend to Danny," And then he gets distracted by like how old she is. And he kind of, he's just <laughs> like, wow, she real old. I mean, I'm old, but she real, real old. Right. And then you're like, but really like scrutinize this a little bit more here. <laughs> like, why is she so, I don't know. He, he's just very, um, He's very inclined to take the information that people are offering him and especially the cooperation that people are offering him at face value. Um, he's just trusting, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's he's even more so than Ned, really. Like if you when you read Ned, Ned's chapters, he's much more like questioning people's motives and things like that. Like when he's talking, you know, when he's talking to Littlefinger and talking to Pycelle and people like that, he's much more <laughs> suspicious. And he questions like them right to their face. Than ever is. <laughs> you know, Barristan is much, you know, maybe Ned is the Barristaniest. Oh. <laughs> oh, plot twist. Barristaniest. <laughs> <laughs> Did we have any I thoughts? guess Barristan oh. is older. Yeah, that's true. He was he was califragilistic, super expialidocious. He's the OG <clears throat> Ned. Do we have any thoughts on the conversation that he has with Drink and Arch? Like, I, I was very struck by that, but I couldn't quite figure out why. I, I guess so it was, we can. Oh, sorry, you <laughs> say like I guess it was just like an, a part of Arch that we haven't really seen that I that I kind of enjoyed seeing, but. Um... Yeah, I don't know. You can see the the narrative forming in Garrus Drinkwater's mind about what Doran is going to hear. Like, oh, she laughed at him, and then she burned him with the dragons, and Doran will be like, what? And obviously Archibald comes across as like, you know, the the, the better knight, the better man, obviously. More pragmatic and realistic, and yeah, yeah. I I do I do really like um like what you're saying, Michael, where we were thinking before about how the narrative around Danny is already filtering down to us as being like very, very negative and maybe not completely unjustifiedly so, right? Because the the reports that are circulating about her are based in things that she has actually done that are very ambivalent. Um, and so Barristan says that he'll, he did not like this Garris drink water, nor would he allow him to vilify Daenerys. And I think that that's potentially, as you're saying, like a, a foreshadowing, not just of the narrative that Garrus is going to shape, but of the way that it's going to spread, um, especially the more, you know, the, the further out the stories get about what she's done in Marine and um, how that's unfolding. Well, but, I mean, the young guy have been spreading lies about her for who knows how long. But they're not lies, right? Like, that's the very well, some of them are. The best, some the best calumnies have a hint of truth in them. Someone right. says that in some chapter. I'm sure it's a little yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as Barristan says here, you know, she did not laugh. If you knew her better, you would not say that. And like, that's. Yeah. But they don't know her. That's kind of the point. Like, yeah, but Garrus is an idiot. <laughs> I just fucking hate him. <laughs> I don't hold that kind of vitriol for this fictional character. But okay, he's my I, guy. I just have a real strong suspicion of what he's going to do when he gets back to Westeros, and it's just he's just gonna stir shit up. Oh, you think he's gonna make it back to Westeros? He's a future shit stirrer in the making. Yeah, maybe. I'd be surprised if those two make it through this little coup. I feel, I just feel that they have to make it back to, like, make the journey of Quentin full circle. They have to report back to Doran and stuff. That's more interesting if they get <laughs> Fuck back. Fuck me. If they make it back yeah. to Westeros before Danny, god damn it. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, I think. I mean, I think that ultimately um, Quentin is going to become a second Elia on some level, right? Like, but that in a just in a different faction, like he's going to be another thing that Duran like broods on and and you know holds against this. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yes, the to, family. They yeah. Have to get back, so you know, which is going to motivate Doran to presumably ally with Young Griff. And, you know, so they definitely have to get there before Daenerys does. And it makes sense that they would, like, just one ship sailing back to Westeros should get there faster than, you know, an army and dragons. And, you know, plus Daenerys probably has to stop and conquer Volantis, at least, along the way. <laughs> that should be only two or three books. We should be okay. Yeah, I yeah. I kind of feel like Daenerys might have a turn and just go back through and burn all these 
places to the ground. Oh, definitely. Like, she will have a darker turn of character, um, but I don't think she'll descend into outright villainy. But she's she's not going to be sitting in Atlantis for, like, a book the way she was sitting in Marine. She's gonna trying be like, to be a better queen. Fuck that. The readers don't have time for this. <laughs> well, I think she's going to get to the point where she doesn't, she believes she's better than these people deserve. Well, isn't she already at that point, though? Like, where she says... <sighs> In the dragon or in the um, fighting pits, when they're all chanting Misa, she's like, "I'm not your mother. I'm so tired right. of these people." And you're like, "Whoa, that's, you can have that's this more, garbage." That's more against like the the people, the uh, the slaver caste, not necessarily the the freedmen themselves. But in the next Danny chapter, which we are slowly getting close to, I think that's when she truly breaks and is like, "Marine's never going to be my home." Mm-hmm. Well, I wonder too if there's not some kind of um, something that forces her hand as far as burning the slaver cities, not just rage, but if they really are going to fling plague corpses into Marine, is there a point at which it's an issue of like biohazardous containment that she just has to, to burn it all to ashes so that the pale mare doesn't overrun? I mean, I guess maybe she wouldn't care if the pale mare overran Slaver's Bay, but it seems like if a whole city is infected, like what are you going to do except... <laughs> you know, without without going too far down the road of discussing a lot of stuff that's not in this chapter, uh, just, you know, if anybody hasn't read Eliana from Girls Gone Canon's essay about Daenerys and Shakespeare, that, or I shouldn't say essay because it's really, it's really a lot longer than that. Uh, I remember I read that back last spring and it really, uh, it really convinced me that Daenerys is going to take a more, a more villainous turn. You know, especially in sort of a Shakespearean sense of, you know, Richard the Third, Merchant of Venice type villain. Richard the so Third. That's, that's definitely something that is that's misunderstood. Something I'd read. Like playing down Magor. <laughs> all I said again, yes, but all I said was he is very cruel. He is just not that much more cruel than anyone else in this world to warrant being the cruel. That's that's all I was ever saying is that he is not an outlier deserving of a sobriquet. He is right in continuity with like <laughs> like he's not he's not, you know, Tywin yes, Tywin the monster. He's not, you know, Tywin the slayer of children like he's just tywin like he didn't get a yeah. you know name that's all that's all i was never saying that's because Nagor is not tywin won. cruel no, no. <laughs> so, tywin so, hasn't so had the time say... for his name to be to drag through the nut mud yet <laughs> right. so what you, you need to be monster? a ruler i guess yeah, like, you're, you're saying that uh that uh Megor was cruel, but also a little cool. Megor, so. Megor the cool. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm. It's not, okay if you're a Megor fan. I'm boy. not no pro Megor. <laughs> I'm just saying. Megor, red key. He doesn't. He's like, oh my god. I don't want to put words we've in learned, your mouth, but it kind of sounds that like Tywin you're is pretty good at like hiding stuff. So I get, yeah, I, I get, know. like maybe it should have just been like Megor needs better pr like maybe that's the the takeaway here <laughs> like, good god goebbels he's when um again <clears throat> he's not okay he is but very when, cruel when did they start don't... calling him Megor the cruel do we right. know i mean I think was it after a, yeah i think so i think it's like a retroactive no i think it's was stirring when he was killing all the people the religious people yeah i got like it's the so so really you know but really did him a favor then i guess i get that like everyone should be the cruel i think is religious is what people I'm really are the saying. worst like, yeah all right well <sighs> i feel like my position has been consistently misrepresented in this discussion. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry. i feel so sad for you it's not like anyone else has a problem with someone feeling that that they have to say sorry to me every time they say something bad about the gray joys oh uh, i mean <laughs> Yeah, Victorian fanboy over here. Right. All right, fair. Victorian the fool. Fair. <laughs> I like Victorian. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it. He's a. Of geez. course you do. Of He's course not. You do. <laughs> I hate you so much. Guys, Euron is the best. Yeah. I always like you. I always like you, Sarah. Aww. So <laughs> Euron, Euron has introduced very interesting narrative possibilities, but he is he a has. terrifying. That is true. He is a yeah, terrifying. Yeah, the poor da- beast, like, damn fair is gonna. Damn fair. fair. Use a hyphen. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) It clearly (laughs) says damn fair. Um, Anything else on this chapter? (laughs) I I feel like we've gotten wildly off track here. Um, 
At least it's at the end. It is. And I feel like also very fitting for our 100th episode because it is pretty representative of our VOK style. So I'm pretty excited that we've brought we brought the crazy theories. We've brought the uh, the wild, you know, derailing of the discussion. I really feel like we're representing ourselves pretty well. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. I about like it. the battle plans that they're making in this chapter, but they have all the disagreements. So it makes me interested to see what the final battle of fire will turn out, how the how the troops are deployed. Yeah, it seems like their only competent defense is the unsullied, and they want to like spread them right out. Yeah, that was that was disconcerting. Where they were like, "Let's put a third here," and I'm like, "That seems." Yeah, it seems like a mistake if they're not one big unit. Yeah, you say that, but I Dude, think they're they going against functions. people on stilts. No. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> 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 are the still people the ones that are chained together, or is that a different group? They're they're I a different they're slave chained. group. <laughs> there's a number they of different suck. slave armies that are yeah. chained together. Actually, I oh, think. Are oh, okay. I then there's was, like, the, <laughs> the group of hot guys led by the lady, and they only come out in their underwear, but they all have hot bodies. <laughs> <laughs> the hunk brigade. So anyway, a third might be enough. Sure. <laughs> it shouldn't really matter. Fair. Maybe they fair. should just put a third of them out in front of the city and just let them defend the whole place. Uh, yeah, I, I love Grey Worm just being like, I, fucking whatever. We'll do whatever. Like, this is not... Uh, it's like he doesn't even want to be a part of battle plans because that's not what they do. Yeah. Uh, like they're... like the slaver said that made them. It's like, no, they'll need captains over the top of them. They don't understand. They just do what they're told. Do we believe that they will actually give the Tattered Prince Pentos? Oh, oh God, why? I don't know if they can. Tattered but Prince if they get what like they such want. An afterthought. Narratively convenient for this to happen, because it's to bring Danny into contact with uh, Illyrio, and then she's right next to King's Landing to confront other people. Yeah, it would make a lot of sense if, if Daenerys did off did honor that, <laughs> and so Westeros, a lot of Westeros gets introduced to her as the lady who conquered Pentos and gave it over to this tattered prince asshole. So it's another part of the whole, like, turning Westerosi public opinion against Danny, basically, in a lot of ways, through no fault of her own. But, you know, it'll, it'll, uh, <laughs> It'll give credence to the stories that are all always that are already circulating about how you know she laughed at Quentin and then roasted him with her dragon and. I just picture her holding a tiny dragon and like pointing it at him like a flamethrower. I don't like. Jokaris, <laughs> <laughs> <It's like, laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I, you know, obviously it's been set up for a long time, but I'm excited in this reread to, to really think about all the stuff that's like poised right on the precipice of just like smashing together in these very kind of epic ways, um, you know, when the book comes out. Yeah, which <laughs> any day now. Yeah. Yeah. Right about the same time the Tattered Prince gets pent up. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, Stephen I so. King finished it in a night, so I see no reason why George can't finish it in, I don't know, 10 years. <laughs> right. I, I have a very, in, in my head now, like firmly established as canon, that he had genuinely written all of Winds of Winter and then something erased it off his computer. And like there was some kind of massive, like he forgot to hit save or something. And like... <laughs> So now he's like, I feel like he wasn't backing up. He's like so demoralized that it's taken. I feel like if that were the case, life. though, it'd be pretty easy to clack it back out. You know, like what it though? You, you'd like, know the way the story was going to go, though. Like you just need to fill in the details again. Yeah. I feel like I would be so sad that I would just be like, you know what? I don't even want. I'm going to write some wild cards. Maybe a dunk. Or he like Ugh. finished. It. Like, he finished it and submitted it to like Elio and Linda? the other dude, and they were like, Linda? "Hey, uh, can Linda? You just <laughs> the other dude. Linda. The other dude, yeah." <laughs> He, she, we don't care on this podcast, right? right. Um, She's a dragon. She's a dragon. <laughs> it is a dragon. So, uh, like, he submits it to them, and they're like, oh, these are actually, there's two, in, like, things that can't happen because of this. And he's like, fuck, I gotta rewrite the whole thing. No, I, I imagine it's something even more petty. It's like, oh, but this character's eyes are blue, not green, like you said. He's like, fuck this. Fuck you guys. Fuck you nerds. Like, I'm done. <laughs> Just, like, burn it to the ground. Yeah. 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 Destroy my DOS computer. Still doing <laughs> Like, but we're still doing fire and blood, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. George, you should probably think about reading it so you can get the history in your head. Uh, it's like, no, I'm going to play Oregon Trail on my DOS computer. Don't bother. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so should I wrap it up? Sure. I think, unless anybody else has anything to say about the second Barristan chapter. Uh, nope. Start wrapping. Okay. All right. 
Thank you guys for joining us. These are the final published chapters in July 300 AL, and they take us to the Battle of Marine. July 300 contained 13 chapters, not counting Tiwau, and included Danny flying away, a variety of people gathering at Marine, and the death of Quentin. That's right, the death of Quentin. So a year ago, we were still in Clash of Kings, and George took just five chapters to cover the action. Marcella was sent to Dorn, King's Landing was riding, John was at the Fist of the First Men, Theon was riding to Torrin Square, and then took Winterfell. For those of you following along at home, first of all, my apologies, and second of all, the next episode of the reread <laughs> will exclusively cover content from Wow. Normal service will resume on episode 102. For more Vassals of Kingsgrave, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, iTunes, and WordPress by searching for Vassals of Kingsgrave. To get involved, please search for Podcast of Ice and Fire and join the forums. Does anybody have any forthcoming episodes or anything else that they want to pitch? Recording Harry Potter, Goblet of Fire tomorrow. Nice. I have I have plans in the works for another seminar of Ice and Fire, um, but we have to decide the topic. So I'll put up a, a tentative CTA for that um, pretty soon and we can figure out what we're going to do. And <laughs> thank you guys so much for joining me on this, our 100th episode. I'm honored to be hosting it and I had a wonderful time talking with all of you. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. You were fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Bye, Good guys. Job, Sarah. Thank you. Bye. It's raining men. Hallelujah. <laughs> you don't know that they're men. This oh. is the worst rapping I've ever heard. It doesn't rhyme. There's yeah, no rhythm or like flow white. to it. Hey, you guys. Jesus. It's the first time. I'm, break. <laughs> I, I am taking what Bina has given to us in her generosity, and I am presenting it as it was given. So if you want to take it up with Bina, I, I really feel like that's on you because I, for one, am not going to question her generosity and authority. And if you want to, then that's fine. But, you know, maybe history will remember you as the cruel as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's raining men. Hallelujah. <laughs> you don't know that they're men. Um, you guys are too intelligent for me. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> There's not a dick joke in here. Could the seminar be on, on Dick Jokes on of Dicks. Ice and Fire? <laughs> I mean, I think of all the people on this cast today, I'm the least qualified to do a cast on Dicks, but I guess, like, not that you I are Dicks, but more, more than, than I have. I don't have one. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Are we it's talking just, just a on guess? That note? Are we talking like individual? <laughs> like... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying how many times I've definitely touched a dick more than you have, but I think you have touched more variety. It's just a guess. I might be wrong. Like I would have, I would have stopped earlier, Brett. Yeah, yeah, I want to see where this goes now. Yeah. No, I keep touching it all the time. I don't. I'm not going to oh stop. <laughs> all right, this is the after after show. <laughs> NC-17. Uh, this is Dick Talk. Oh, this is Dick Talk. This has been Dick Talk oh, with White Raven. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Is that like is that like the porn version of TikTok? <laughs> Dick Talk? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is now. I think I think that's what we've all learned here today. We got to reserve our name on that. Right. Someone get on that. Yeah. That's There's it. no it's way Dick the Talk isn't already of reserved. Of Dick Talk back to the back. <laughs> with just a K, though. Dick, I love it. Yeah, look for us on look for us on TikTok, searching Vassals of Kingsgrave. Look uh, for Valk on TikTok. <laughs> I think not only have we fallen off the rails at this point, we have set the rails on fire and are careening towards the edge of a cliff. So 